Well, amen. I'm glad, I'm glad you could join us for wonderful worship time. Thank you, bud, so much. Here's a... We're going to be looking this morning for a few minutes at the reliability of the Scripture, and I have a verse that I want to start with, but before I comment on it, I want to tell you about a little experience I had a couple of years ago when I was going to preach on this text. Uh, some of you will know this text, but it's where the Ethiopian eunuch had been to Jerusalem, and he was coming back, and Philip, the evangelist, got into his chariot and, was sh and shared the gospel with him. And, uh, and this eunuch said, well, what prevents me from being baptized? And uh, Philip said, if you believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart, you may. And I remembered that. And so it says that they got out of the chariot, uh, they came across a pool of water, and he got out of the chariot and baptized him. So I thought, uh, I forget the sermon I was on, but I do remember thinking that would be a great text. If you believe with all your heart, then you can be baptized. And so I, I knew it was in the book of Acts, so I went over to the book of Acts looking for it. And I, if you have, uh, if you want to look at this with me, it's Acts chapter 8. Uh, <clears throat> let me ask you. How many of you have a version of the Bible, a translation of the Bible, other than the King James Version? Would you hold your hand? Let me see how many we got. Okay. All right. So I found the text, and in, it's in Acts 8. I'll start reading in verse 35. Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with Scripture, he told the the, told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Here is water. What pre prevents me from being baptized? Now that's verse 36. Here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And I thought, that's it. That's the text I'm looking for. Verse 37 is the answer. And, and I'm looking... And I have no verse 37. Do y'all see that? There's no 37. Does it just go 36, then 38? It's like, what did they do with my text? <laughs> there goes my sermon. Now, if they do include verse 37, they may have a little asterisk or a note there that says something like, some manuscripts do not add verse 37. Um, so that was a bit annoying. And then if, if you want to see another example of this, go to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. And... Verse 8, And they went out and fled from the tomb, trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And then right there, there's a little statement in brackets in my Bible that says this, Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include verse 9 through 20. That's Mark 16. And do, do, how many has that little note or bracket in your Bible? Okay. 
Well, there's another example. Is it in or is it out? And you know, another one, we won't take the time to turn to it, but another one is the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. You'll find that little bracketed note that says many of the earliest manuscripts do not include this story. You know, the woman caught in adultery who's... And Jesus said, those of you without sin cast the first stone. And that's not in the Bible. It's not in the earliest manuscripts. So that's kind of what we're looking at this morning. Do we have a preserved Bible or do we not? Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. Here's what it says. This is the English Standard Version. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve them. You will guard them. You, O oh Lord, will keep them. In light of that statement, I want to come out of the closet today, <laughs> in a sense, uh, and tell you, I believe that the book we hold in our hand, which is called the Word of God, is truly the very words of Almighty God. And that God has committed Himself to preserve these words. You, O Lord, will keep them. Now, where do they get the, uh, where do they get the ideas that these are not in the earliest manuscripts? Well, it's true, they're not. Uh, there are some manuscripts. All of the, manus the Greek manuscripts from which the scriptures are taken, these are all New Testament, these are copies. Uh, we do not have the originals. But we don't need the originals. Um, it's one of the ways you know the church accepted the originals is because they were used up. I mean, I used to have, when I was growing up, uh, when I first started preaching, I used to have Bibles, and I would read them every day, and I would preach, I would use them in the pulpit, and I'd beat on them, and they were used up. And I'd replace them with new ones, but it's the same Bible, just different coverings. In the same way, the original manuscripts were read in churches all over the known world. And so it, the ink would fade. They, they would scroll it and it would flake off. But they made copies. And they, uh, how do you know that the copies were precise and without error? Because God said, or David said about his word, I will keep. God said, I will keep those words, I will preserve them. And the Holy Spirit led them into all truth. He led those apostles so that, and He led the church so that it preserved the exact words of God. Today, if you look this up, you will find that in the Greek New Testament, there are over five thousand copies of the Greek New Testament called the majority text and those copies agree together now there are some earlier ones uh, the copies would run about four or five hundred AD 
Earlier ones might go back to 100 A.D., 200 A.D., but because they're earlier doesn't necessarily mean they're the best. It could just mean that they weren't copied, that they weren't used up because they were defective. Let me show you, uh, I think we have this picture of the, the Bill of Rights. Can we put that up there? This is the original Bill of Rights, a couple hundred years old. Uh, and you can see how, especially in the middle part, it's faded. If you go to Washington, D.C. and look this up in the museum, you won't be able to read it. And it's only 200 years old. But we, have, we know exactly what it said right down to the very words that were used because there are copies all over the world compared to each other. And uh, so that you can say that what we hold in our hand today is the very Word of God. Now, sometimes you'll hear of some discovery. Um, did you all, do you all remember some years ago they came out with the discovery that they found the Gospel of Thomas and uh, uh, that it was, why was it neglected? You know, and Jesus married Mary Magdalene and they have kids over in India and you have all these crazy notions, uh, but you cannot have something discovered thousand years later and say God preserved his word intact. No, if it's not in there, it doesn't belong in there. If it wasn't in there from the time of the apostles, it doesn't belong in there. But God has given us a true word. The Gospel of Thomas has teachings in it that the early church said Jesus didn't say that. That's not from the apostles. Thomas didn't write that. And I'll give you an example. One of the things in the Gospel of Thomas is that women can't go to heaven. Here's what uh, Peter said according to the Gospel of Thomas. Simon Peter said, Mary Magdalene should leave us because females are not worthy of life. And Jesus said, I will guide her so that she will become a man. And then she too will be a living spirit resembling you men, for every female who becomes a male will, will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. So the early church heard that and said, that's stupid. And Thomas didn't write. See, that's a forgery. They, know, they knew that wasn't the Word of God. That's not whosoever will may come, except for the women. They cannot come. They knew that was wrong. So in some of your versions, you will see those little notes. And so I would say ignore them. Now I use the English Standard Version because it translates it word for word. Some of the versions translate it thought for thought. They try to capture the thought of the Greek text. The English Standard Version tries to capture the very wording, the very vocabulary, the tenses of the Greek text. So that's why I use the English Standard. But it, the, even the English Standard still has those little notations that this is, may not be part of the original text, but I just ignore it and go on. And that's what I would suggest to you, not that you stop using all other versions except the King James Version, but I would just say, okay, if you have that note, then the note is wrong, I'll just stay with what's, what we have here. And most of the versions will go ahead and include the te that passage um, uh, anyway. And so just ignore those notes and you'll be fine. The Bible, as we have it, is called the Textus Receptus. That's Latin for the received text. All these other texts 
or rejected text by the early church. They didn't accept them. So, but what we have is the textus receptus, the received and accepted text of the New Testament. Um, so when the gospel, somebody says the gospel of Thomas belongs as a fifth gospel, we say it was not received by the early church. Now, let me add this. To my Roman Catholic friends, there are several books in the Roman Catholic Bible called the Apocrypha. These were written between Malachi, the old, end of the Old Testament, and before Matthew, beginning of the New Testament. So they're squeezed right in there. And the Roman Catholic Church puts in their Bible these, I don't know, six or eight books, uh, First and Second Maccabees, Book of Jubilees, uh, probably books most of you have never read or heard of. It, it doesn't matter. They put them in. Now, a couple of things on that in the Roman Catholic Bible. Number one, those were not accepted in the Bible until after 1600 A.D. So they're very late in the history of the church. Number two, they, none of those books are quoted or referred to in the New Testament. Most of the books of the Old Testament are quoted or referred to in the New Testament. Those books, though, that come, uh, they want them to be part of the Old Testament. They're 1600 A.D. They stuck, they inserted them in, and they're never referred to, never quoted in the Old, in the New Testament. Therefore, we do not hold them to be part of the Bible. Um, here's a verse that I think you should be aware of. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. You shall not add to, nor take from. So the omissions of some... The additions of some, and the Mormons even replace the whole Bible, give you the Book of Mormon. I mean, none of these can stand. What we have is the very Word of God, not to be added to, not to be taken from. In 1650, there was a Bible that was printed when they, they just first started printing Bibles. And it was called the Wicked Bible. And the reason it was called the Wicked Bible is because when they printed Exodus 20 as part of it, in the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, they left out one word. Do we have that? Uh, show us the Wicked Bible. This is 1650 edition. In verse 14, Thou shalt commit adultery. But hey, it's only one word. <laughs> What's the big deal? Just leave out one word. One word makes a difference. The guy who printed that Bible, they went all over the world. Uh, and the guy who printed it was arrested and almost put to death. In fact, he may have been put to death. I don't know. People were so outraged. The other, the other Sunday, we were welcoming Junior and his wife, Therese, me and uh, Brandon. And uh, we, we, said, we were encouraging uh, Junior to sing because he sings good. J Junior, I don't want to embarrass you here. hope you're okay with that. Uh, and and uh, uh, so we said, you can sing. And, uh, and I said, you could take up the offering. We were trying to, we want him to get involved. He said, you can take up the offering. And Brandon said, you can take the offering. <laughs> and I was like, 
wait just a minute. <laughs> There's a whole lot of difference between you can take up the offering and you can take the offering. So I said, uh, okay, well, maybe not take the offering because <laughs> it was a good offering that Sunday. And, <laughs> and the word up seemed to be too much. One single word, Psalm 12 again, the words of the Lord are pure words. They've been refined in a furnace, and you, O oh God, will preserve them. You will protect them. You will keep them. So that's kind of my introduction. I'm going to just real quick walk through 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 23. So turn over to 1 Peter 1, 23, and I want to give you uh, four things that Peter says about the Scripture. Number one, in verse 23 that we read earlier, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. You are born again, how? By the Word of God. Again, I refer to my Roman Catholic friends because I read them all the time. They're my favorite authors. They've pondered these things for centuries. And I love them. I love these guys. And I have Roman Catholic priests who are friends. They have seven sacraments. And in their catechism, it plainly says, these give life to you. Uh, do we have the seven sacraments? But, yeah, put those up there. These give life. And I noticed not one of them is preaching the Word of God. And I'm like, why is preaching not central? Now, in the Protestant church, it is central. We don't have the pulpit on the side. We have it in the middle because it's central. And listen to what Peter says. You were born again, not from perishable seed, but through the living and abiding Word of God. That's how you got born again. Spiritual life came to you through the preaching and the reading of the Scripture. James 1.18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. See, it's by the word. Number two thing Peter says about in this verse, it's not only indispensable because it gives us new birth, but it's imperishable. You see that? It, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, incorruptible. You can't have a Bible that ages, changes, decays, or grows old, grows weak, with books lost, books added. You cannot have a Bible that's corrupted or corruptible and claim it to be the Word of God. Peter says it is imperishable, incorruptible. Number three, it is indestructible. Look at verse 23, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and abiding word. It's abiding. For all flesh is like grass, its glory is like the flower. People's bodies, it's like we grow up like grass quickly, perishes as quickly. When it, and in our youth and beauty, it's like the flower. And it's gone almost as soon as it's present. But he says, the word of God remains forever, verse 25. We put so much emphasis on youth and beauty. We spend hundreds of dollars on cosmetics. Men, we spend hundreds of dollars on our cars. Women want to look good. Men want their cars to look good. And it's all, it all perishes. But the Word of God abides forever. Aren't you glad there's something you can leave your children that will be here even after they're gone? Is the Word of God. So he says, it is indestructible. A man was challenged 
to build a wall that no one could ever knock over. And he said, I think I can do it. He built a five-foot high wall that was six feet wide. And when they knocked it over, it just made it higher and stronger. He made it because he built it five foot high and six feet wide. Turn it over, now it's six feet high. That's the way the Bible is. When you attack it, it just makes it emerge stronger than ever before. Someone said, the Bible has to be from God because it has survived the neglect of the church, the failures of the preachers, the critiques of the scholars, the persecutions of the government, and the errors of its translators. It has survived it all, and we still have it. So a sum, the summary here. Peter says it's the indispensable word because we're born again by it. It's the imperishable word because it's incapable of decay. And it's the indestructible word because it abides forever. And one final thing, it's the incomparable word. Look at verse 25. The word of the Lord remains forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you. The gospel, how we get saved, how we get forgiven, how we go to heaven. Jesus died for us, Jesus rose again, and Jesus is coming back for us. The gospel... If I wanted to preach the gospel, the good news, what book would I turn to? What book would I open? Would it be the Koran? No, because Islam doesn't believe Jesus died on the cross. If you want to go to heaven, you have to have, they, they give you five rules or pillars of the faith. Uh, they're all things you have to do. Is it the... A Hindu book, the Hare Krishnas, is what, what book do I open? I open the Bible because therein is the gospel. It's the word of God by which the gospel is preached to you. What makes this book so valuable? The gospel is in it. Wow, it's incomparable. And that's what I love about the Bible. It is the word by which you were evangelized. So, this morning, the big issue with the Bible is not whether it's reliable, but whether it's read. Not does it have power, but is it preached. So I'm thankful today that we have this Bible And I hope you'll join me in reading it and hearing it preached. Let's pray together. Ushers, you come. Let's worship God with our offering. We're going to take up the offering now. (laughs) Amen. He has preserved his words. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your holy word, your precious word that you have preserved it through the ages. And what we hold in our hands is what the early church held in their hands centuries ago. And you have promised to preserve its words. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name.